Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I'm very happy uh, to be here with Sam today. We work closely together on the publishing partnership that Ulight has uh, with Burnaway. I'll tell you a little bit more about that when we introduce ourselves. <laughs> so yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. Everyone. Editing and editors. I think we also, by the way, I should say, you know, we're, we're talking a little bit about the editorial process today, uh, but a lot of, and we didn't want to take for granted that people showing up here today or people uh, accessing this online uh, would be deep into publishing careers or, you know, have any published work at all and might be coming for information specifically about uh, how to contact those editors, where to reach them. So it's, we're going to talk a little bit about the editorial process, but also talk about getting that work in front of people. Yeah, we're kind of starting a little bit from the beginning. Yeah. You know, so, but. Sorry. <laughs> this is us. <laughs> Should I read your bio? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> so Jason, he's a, <laughs> he's a writer, editor, and publisher born and raised in Miami. He's a contributing editor for Burnaway Magazine with whom Oolite Arts has a partnership. Burnaway's based in Atlanta, but Jason is the Miami editor. Uh, and, the, and he's also the publisher of Islandia Journal. He's written for the Miami New Times, The Bitter Southerner, Plowshares, Untitled Art, and the Hollywood Arts and Culture Center. And he was a co uh, contributing writer to Florida, which is a guidebook published by A24, filled with lots of cool Florida artists. So Monica Userowicz, uh, a much longer bio, y'all. <laughs> She's been published in a lot of places, friends. <laughs> is a writer and photographer born in Brooklyn and raised in Florida. Her work has appeared in Art Forum, The Believer, Bomb, Burnaway, Cultured, Dean, The New York Review of Books, Pin Up, and elsewhere. In 2020, she received an Andy Warhol Arts Writers Grant for Groundwater, an essay series about Floridian and Caribbean artists whose work elucidates or works to mitigate the local effects of climate change. She recently received an Ellie's Creator Award and, an a and a Wave Maker Grant for Dreaming as the Water Rises, a project examining dreams about water and the climate crisis in Florida. Her photographs have been exhibited globally and most recently on display at Miami's Oolite Arts as part of the group show, Feels Like 97 Degrees. Sorry, that was... Monica likes water. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I should say that the pieces that we've been able to collaborate on uh, as part of the Oolite's Burn Away Oolite uh, Burnaway Publishing Partnership, uh, where I'm editing Monica's work, uh, have been, I think, mostly under the Andy Warhol grant. So those were pieces that were that were published as part of that grant, right? All of them were. All of them were. Yeah, all of the, everything I've written with you. Okay. And they all had to do with water. Water, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so while it's, I think it's key to keep in mind that you need not write with the intention of publishing or write with the intention of like getting it in front of people. You should still, whatever idea you have, even if it is an art review, which is typically something public, or if it's like your own creative work, it doesn't need to be in front of anybody. But we wanted to share some of that information because that's a big part of our writing and editing experience. Most of our, most of my editorial process comes from working directly with editors. So we wanted to talk about that first contact with an editor. Um, and also practically speaking, like if you intend to make a career of writing in any way, shape, or form, or, or to make any sort of living, and, to, you know, and you do intend to put that work out there, uh, you need to know where to find these people and, and how to get paid. <laughs> So this, this slide was, uh, this was me, this was pure chaos, but it's sort of indicative of the landscape that's out there. Um, I think we think a lot about where to publish what kind of uh, piece that you're writing. So whether it's um, an art review specifically, and that might be, you know, for Burn Away up top or hyper allergic, and we'll get into the sort of like weeds a little bit on the nuances between publications, right? Um, or whether it's a personal essay or a piece of fiction, there are all these different places to have your work published. And part of publishing your work is understanding the landscape of publications. 
right? So that's like where you have to begin, is, is developing a knowledge of publications and the different sort of nuances and the kind of work that they publish. Which just happens by being a reader, too. Just like knowing what, knowing what you enjoy reading. I think that's the biggest part of writing at all, honestly. Writing which, and editing. Yeah, <laughs> which is like sort of gets to this point that Monica and I are just like, why are you writing what you're writing? So if you are writing what you're writing because you want to write what you want to see in the world, what you want to read, uh, figure out what you like reading and then go there. <laughs> uh, and so part of that is, is tracking the people who will help you get this work published uh, down. Yeah, you can. Um Finding editors, again, I'm going to emphasize, not the, the most crucial part of the writing process, but there are so many different resources that we're going to share at the end um, that include like not only the editor's names and contacts, and how but also how much they pay and things like that to help you narrow down where it is you want to write. Um, Jason made this slide and included <laughs> Jewish Currents because they're really good, even if you're not going to write for Jewish Currents. They're a really incredible example of a publication that makes their contacts very available and they make their um, needs really, really clear, what they actually want in a pitch, what they want in a story, and that's extremely helpful. You can also utilize resources like Study Hall, which we'll talk about later, and you can just Google people. Pe like Editors are highly... Um, a lot of editors are highly accessible. Most of them are on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them are on Twitter, and so, you know, uh, like you see my search term there, editor, New York Times, it's a place to start, right? Uh, New York Times is not gonna have the same information available that Jewish Currents does, right? Like Monica said, Jewish Currents will not only give you contact information for every specific editor, but also tell you what you'll be paid for specific types of pieces, the types of things you're lo they're looking for, uh, expectations on timing, all of that is sort of put up out, out front. It's probably to save them, like they did a lot of labor to put that out there, but it's probably in the end to save themselves that labor in the communication process. Uh, whereas something a little bit more monolithic, like a legacy publication, they don't, like, they have staff writers, they have regular freelancers, they, they don't necessarily need your work as much, right? And, and so you have to try and track these people down, you know, go into their property records, find birth certificates, uh, you know, and really let them know that you know who they are. And it isn't creepy if you do that, by the way. <laughs> I've, never, I've never, like, s sneakily found an email and wrote to the person and had them respond with, how did you, how did you find my contact? It's out there, like, we're all, everything is available. Like you are <laughs> working professionally as an editor, like, as somebody who interacts with other people and relies on other people to submit work. Yeah, and I've never personally, in my capacity as an editor for Burnaway or uh, in taking in work for Islandia Journal, like not wanted somebody to message me. In fact, I make myself very, I'm like, message me on social media. Send me an Instagram DM. Here's my email address. You know, not, I don't give out my cell phone number. But, uh, you know, if you want that, I'll give it to you right after this talk. You know, it, access is key. Let's see what else we got here. <laughs> Okay, so we get into pitching now. Once you've found these people, once you've found an email address, and in the case of somebody like the New York Times, by the way, um, what you might find is the name of an editor, and then you know, I've done this before, and it's kind of a long shot, but uh, where you know what the second half of the email, uh, de like the, what do you call oh, right, it? Right, you know the URL, you know the domain name. It's that at nytimes.com or whatever. <laughs> you follow the format of how the other <laughs> I think anybody who's like, like in publishing has like are writing a lot and freelancing a lot has had that moment where they're like, okay, what's the format? Is it first name dot last name at newyorktimes.com? And, and so you gotta, I mean, that's part of it too. You, when you believe that your work is, is worthy of being in that publication and you wanna be paid by that publication, uh, it's worth it to put yourself in front of them uh, no matter how many times you've published or not. Pitching is also really, in a really important part of your editorial process, even if you've, at whatever stage you're at in the writing process, whether you've just had this idea, or if it's longer, or if it's a series of like scattered paragraphs, pitching helps you 
nail down exactly what it is you want to say, right? And condenses it to key points or the thing you're most concerned about or the thing you most want to like, give attention to. So whether or not you're writing a pitch email, when you're editing, you do need to, you, I would recommend going through this kind of outline process. Pitching, in a way, is outlining it for somebody else. It's the, first, it's the first yeah. edit, you yeah. know, in a way you're like, we'll share, we'll share some sort of like shibboleth about pitching, right? Uh, you know, the style of pitch that people might want to receive. But it's, it's good for you as a writer if you have an idea to be able to condense it down uh, and it's, you know, not to turn it all into salesmanship, but there is some element of it where you have to be as clear and direct, um, you know, especially if there's a financial you know, relationship about to happen about what you're going to provide to them and, and how you're going to get there. So here is, here is how you would start outlining that, actually. So I want to think about, I want to think about how to talk about this in a way that's whether, why these details are important, whether you're pitching or not, right? Um, Jason and I were talking about how when we pitch reviews, for example, or let's say there's an artist I really want to write about. I really want to do like a profile on a particular artist. I have to think about the timeliness. I have to think about what they call in the journalism world a news peg. What is the upcoming event? What is the quote unquote relevance? You know? That's a jargon alert, y'all. <laughs> jargon alert. Yeah. Yeah. Contemporary <laughs> news peg. Yeah, like, because as much as I want to write about whatever it is I want to write about, part of convincing editors involves pointing to the timeliness of the piece itself. This artist has a show coming up in two months. Why don't we profile them? Um, this historical piece on Key Biscayne, the beach, or I think Virginia Key, rather, is really crucial right now because of the contentious argument over that piece of land and its history and its racialized history, things like that. So you kind of have to find, that's kind of like finding an angle, but it's also part of the why. I know that that goes to the genre, <laughs> but, but, but it, it, it does too though, know. because like it, ultimately if there is a, a contemporary news peg, if there is a timeliness to it, it sort of uh, narrows down the style of piece that you're gonna be able to write in some ways, right? There will have to be if you are tying it into the present day, some if there's an event happening or there will be some element of reported work, right? So part of bringing it into the contemporary is bringing in the voices around whatever event is happening, right? So that's this reported story kind of thing, right? Uh, you think of reportage as like just reporting the news, nightly news, uh, you know, daily journalism type stuff, uh, you know, car accident in 95. But an element of art reviewing is also reporting, right? Yeah, I, you know, in all of Monica's writing that I've edited, there have been bits of interviews with artists, um, and I do the same myself because if it's something that's ongoing, you want to give that space to the artist to explain what they're up to, and uh, and so there is. That's just one style of writing, though, right? So it's like that's why you save yourself, right? If you identify that it is something that has timeliness. And so if it's something that's less bound by time, you get into these other sort of styles of writing. Although even if it is a personal essay, I'm sure, you know, I'm thinking about publications like Catapult. There are lots of places that publish more creative, artistic, personal essays that have very little to do with contemporary journalism. You can still find a way of framing it so that it feels topical, you know, and relevant. I don't like the word relevant. It's not that any story is irrelevant, but topical, I think right. is the better I word. think topical is like, it's timeliness, but in a less specific way. Like a, like a, uh, and a show that's ongoing will have, it'll be up for six weeks or a month, right? And it has this beginning and end, whereas topical might be more 2023, mm -hmm. you know, or uh, still bound by time, but not specific dates necessarily. And the why is very important. <laughs> we should go back real quick to talk about criticism a little bit, maybe. What do you think? I want you to start with that. Because <laughs> yeah. a lot of what we, a lot of what we uh, publish, and specifically, in, and I'm, you know, it's not that I'm plugging it, but it's the reason I'm here primarily is in a sort of burn away slash ooh, like 
capacity because a lot of what we publish and what I would describe Monica's writing that I've had the pleasure of editing as, um, if I had to put it in a category, it would probably be criticism because and criticism sounds like you're being critical, you know, and so I'm sorry if that, like I'm sounding patronizing in any way right now, like explaining what criticism sounds like. But it's, it's so much more than that. You are doing an element of reported work. You're doing an element of your own sort of assertions about that work. Um, you are bringing the work into this sort of time-space continuum of work like it. And so the criticism might be that you're, um, you're putting that work in conversation with other similar work or you know, work in other genres, if it's art or music or literature or philosophy. Uh, and criticism is this, uh, I think we removed, we had like a, a bullet point that was like multi-genre. Yeah, yeah because I think art criticism in general can be more all-encompassing. It's really engagement more so than, it's just engaging with the work, mm. right? You know, yeah. in, in a multitude of ways. That's right. Uh, and, and then these are like, a, you know, like personal essay Monica was referring to, or there are places that like will uh, really want to hear your first person perspective and the way you connect it, like maybe it's a story. You know, we were telling a lot of stories. I'm trying to think if there's a story we were telling each other before this. It, have you written a, a personal essay that's been published that I you can I have written reference? a personal essay. I wrote something for, I wrote two personal essays for the Los Angeles Review of Books, one of their verticals. It had nothing to do with my art criticism career whatsoever. I wrote. I wrote two stories, one about each of my grandmothers. Um, they felt, um, it, the editing process uh, felt similar, honestly, because I was still trying to find exactly what I was, what was most important to me to express. But, um, and the pitching process was pretty similar too. Mm -hmm. um, some of my grandmother's stories became, felt newly topical because of what was going on politically in the world. Um, not that I was trying to bank on that, but it <laughs> gave me a space to finally publish these works. But these were stories I had been working on in some capacity for years alone, actually. So I have. That reminds me, and, and it's a funny thing, I don't know, this is, I'm imposing my sort of personal idiosyncrasies on the genre, but I, I similarly wrote, it's the sort of Jewish Latino urge to write about your grandmother. Yeah, it's <laughs> real. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, it's during the pandemic I wrote an essay, but it was, you know, I guess we call it personal essay because there's an element of the personal, but it was, it, it was critical in nature. And um, I, if you have parents or family who don't necessarily understand what you do as a writer, those are always the most fun pieces to send them because they're like, oh, I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so that, was the, that was the one, you know, it was an essay about my, my, my grandmother as a Holocaust survivor and then sort of tying it all into HBO's plot against America and, and pandemic language and all of this, right? Not specifically arts related. Um, but that was the one that like I had all like, you know, on, aunties and uncles being like, wow, well, we have such a great writer. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of like the why is contained within that yeah and thinking about and we talked a bit about this already but thinking about timing is important too I just mentioned that the those essays that I'd published they became newly interesting in a, in a particular moment in time but um, I had been working on them before you know um, so I probably would have been thinking about them for a I probably would have been wanting to pitch them to a place that didn't, that wasn't operating on like a quick day-to-day -day schedule where they needed to publish things on a daily basis, like something like hyperallergic, where everything is newsworthy and fast-paced and you have to send things quickly. Um, so you want to think about, one, what you're actually writing about, and two, what your capabilities are. Maybe you don't want, maybe there's a show that's ending soon, maybe you don't want to force yourself uh, <laughs> to like write something critical in a small time frame. Maybe you have to think about the next thing that artist is doing mm -hmm. to stretch it out. Based, of course, on the publication's own like timing and publishing schedule. Right, and yeah, Monica referred to like hyperallergic being like a daily publication, whereas uh, what we're doing at Burnaway is, is, you know, specifically as it pertains to Miami Arts, it's like, you know, it's two or three pieces a month. And so in a lot of cases, 
you know, with, with how many writers are interested in writing about the arts in South Florida, we're planning that out, you know, a couple months ahead. So, and it makes it a little bit harder because not every gallery is gonna tell you what's going on in six months or, right? So it's, it requires you sort of finding your way around what's happening and what's interesting and, and what you might be able to write about that might be topical in three months. Um, so every different publication has its, and the best way, by the way, to like understand the timing of a publication is to see how often they publish. Just go on the, go on the Burnaway website, you know, burnaway.org, or go on, you know, Hyperallergic and see how many pieces they're publishing every day. Every single digital publication has a timestamp on the article. And just doesn't require intense mathematics, um, and, and just work backwards for yourself. And then there's print too, by the way, which, um, you know, like Islandia is a print quarterly, but a lot of cases, print might not happen for a year. So you have to think about, you know, the kind of stuff that appears in a, in a printed product versus uh, digital. Oh, okay, this is like a sort of, we, did we talk about like, uh, this goes to why you write, I guess. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I did want to touch on that maybe through this too, because okay. Jason and I were talking about writing what you want to write and why you are the person to write the thing. That's part of the pitching process, one, right? Convincing the editor that you are the person to do this. But that's also the reason you're writing, again, regardless of who's looking at it and who's reading it. I will let you explain this better, but this is, this is a screen cap <laughs> from a piece Jason wrote on spec, <laughs> as we say in the journalism world, meaning there was no guarantee it was going to be published, but he wrote it anyway because he was the person who needed to write this story. <laughs> this was something he genuinely cared about. This is something he'd been following for a long time. It really did not matter. I mean, maybe it did, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, like, whether it was gonna be published or not, but I was the person to write that story about like my grandmother, or I'm the, I feel like I'm the person to review a particular show because it's meaningful to me, right? And this story is a well, perfect in, example. In a way, this, this Monica could have written this too because it specifically has to do with water. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there, there were elements of it, you know, I, I got wind of this uh, out in Everglades City, they have this blessing of the stone crab fleet and you know, with how much of a, things stone crabs are in Miami with the historical sort of nature of Joe's, that sort of icon, icon of Miami, and this being a sort of um, quintessential seafood to South Florida, uh, unique to our region, this being an iconic item, I hadn't really seen anybody ever write anything uh, about the place where it comes from primarily. Um, you know, if you go and you interview some of these stone crabbers out there, They'll tell you they got one client and one client only, and, and they call him Stone Crab Joe. And so I was like, okay, there's something here. There's this blessing of the fleet that they do before every season of stone crabbing. This is a community that is an hour and a half from Miami that not many people have. And there's a history that some people might be familiar with, uh, drug running, um, you know, sort of folklore of Miami. But what about the present day community? And, and then on top of all that, I had found this study that uh, stone crab populations, this is a scientific study, like a journal study of stone crab populations uh, were being uh, affected by rising temperatures in, uh, in the sea, right? So the rising sea ocean acidification, rising sea temperatures uh, led to a few sort of lean years in stone crabbing. So what do these people think about it? And then what do I think about it? You know, how do I sort of bring all this together in the South Florida context and make it relevant to people uh, and in this case, you know, I identified a publication that was more regional. So there were people who were sort of already engaging with foodways, and, uh, you know, and, and maritime uh, folks and, and sort of thinking about their region that way. But I had no idea until I wrote it, until I went out to the thing and saw it myself. So this blessing of the fleet where all these beautiful boats come up. And in a way, you have to go see the thing yourself if you don't know where it's going yet, whether it's an event or if it's reading something or if it's watching something, um, in order to find the way in and in order to get that sort of energy to put it back out into the world. And so it was like Monica says, it's on spec, right? I wrote it because I really wanted to. 
because this was an item that I had personally engaged with, you know, growing up in South Florida, and it was relevant or it's topical always in a way, right? And you have this community that ent relies entirely on its production uh, and, and what that means to them and the way we think about climate change in South Florida and, you know, and let's give you a little snippet. Uh, I talked to a lot of stone crab captains, fourth and fifth generation people uh, from that region who, when I asked them about uh, sea level rise, they said, yes, we believe in sea level rise. Every day it gets higher and then it gets lower. It's called the tides. <laughs> And, and so, you know, it was, it's not that I ever wanted to objectify anybody or, but I, I did think it was important for, you know, we live in a very complicated state, right? And so to, to share these perspectives uh, in a way that uh, people from around the region could understand and, and read. So this is like a little sort of case in point uh, about writing what you want to write, uh, even if you don't know where it's going yet. <laughs> this this slide indicates the importance of uh, speaks to the importance of why you should, as you're writing, you should always be editing your own work. You should always work on the thing, regardless of whether or not someone has gotten back to you about publishing it. You have to be your own editor. This is Jason's desktop. Also, the importance of following up with an editor because yeah. this is like what my brain looks like at any given time. <laughs> Yeah, you ha I think it's perfectly fine to annoy editors um, because they're unfortunately running on a schedule, maybe not even thinking about you, maybe they didn't even see the thing. I have followed up with people three times, four times, and gotten responses eventually, like after the fourth or fifth time, so. And part of that too is like not taking it too personally, I guess, I, I, this, it takes a long time to learn that, mm -hmm. right? Is, is and I think that's part of the learning process for you when you, when you uh, are like observing how often things are published. You're like, okay, well I know it doesn't need to be published tomorrow. Of course I want it to be published tomorrow. But um, thinking about the editor, we're like, I'm like, think about the editor. Um, but I think it is for your own sake too, like don't, and part of writing is following up. And it's also part of establishing the relationship with an editor as well. You, I think it's okay to, have enough confidence in whatever it is you want to write or that you're already writing to nag them a little bit because then they kind of get to know you that way. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you will work with them again and maybe they will become your editor, you know, so. It's not that you necessarily need to like kiss up to them, but if, no, <laughs> but no, it, no, 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 I know, but like if like the follow-up email is like, like if I, if I had been slacking on you know, a piece that Monica had sent me, you know, it was never like, what's the deal? Like, I thought this was gonna go up, you know? Like, that's no way to sort of maintain a relationship with somebody, um, especially when it's built on this foundation of like, okay, we had this first meeting about it and we're both excited about it and we know neither one of us is an asshole. All right, so, so <laughs> like, like, what's going on, you know? Just say, hey, just checking in and seeing what the status of this is. Um, and if there is some sort of timeliness that comes up, you know, gently sort of urging them to get it back out into the world, if possible. And before we get into the actual editorial process, we wanted to share some of our successful and some of our failed pitches <laughs> for stories. <laughs> I, I, I know that my failed pitch, I wrote it, I ended up writing it anyway. Mm. So I think that's important. But that's good to know. What we got first here. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so embarrassing. Um, so I was put in contact. I was put in contact with the arts editor uh, at the New York Times, and through a friend. And he, oh God, I can't. No. <laughs> and he, and he. Talk through the cringe. He suggested I send her multiple ideas. Um, he said, it doesn't even need to be the most professional pitch email. You can ramble a little. It's fine. That's my disclaimer. Um, I really wanted to write about choral morphologic, and I was really chasing um, 
their journey and what they were fighting and what they were dealing with. Coral Morphologic are uh, an artist and marine biologist duo here in Miami, by the way. They make art utilizing the imagery of the corals that they grow and that they save from dredging, but they also do a lot of research on their biological significance, particularly the Miami corals. So I was like, this story is amazing. You know? um, she did not think so. Um, I, the next slide, actually, if you could show, I followed up with her. My apologies, and I followed up with her like I don't know how many times, and then she said, "You can call me." So I don't have the actual rejection here because um, I tend to, as Jason and I were working on this, I realized I delete all of my rejections. <laughs> I don't want to look at them. It's so many. <laughs> and and uh, she rejected me over the phone. Um, she was very nice, but she said, I'm failing to see how this is news, and we're a newspaper. Um, so she, and then she said, when they have a muse museum show, you can, you can call me. And I was like, okay. <laughs> she was really nice. She was just quick. So that, um, but I think that's important, again, because we were talking about what the topical significance of the story is, how you're angling it. I think I maybe could have waited at a, to a different, but like, till a different point well, in time. Was, or you were telling me that you felt a little bit like, like she was like, call me now. And like, so it was, there was, it was kind of a stressful situation. I was like, ah. And also, you know, I actually hadn't heard the context of like, uh, your friend sort of setting you up to just sort of like be diffuse in mm -hmm. your pitch, as opposed to being as targeted as, as you might have wanted to be, you know? That is a good point, you know. So that's, you know, maybe you should call Barbara back. <laughs> no, I, 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 the point is, Mo Monica actually ended up writing this story for Burnaway, I think. I did. Jason a, became my editor yeah. on it, because the publishing schedule is different right. <laughs> at Burnaway. So. Right, it doesn't need to be news, right? It, it, it just, and particularly this sort of sprawling look at what has been a, a long sort of career and many significant moments for that particular duo mm -hmm. um, was a fit, you know, because there was, the, and particularly because Burnaway every year has these uh, theme type stories, so they put out these call for theme stories, and so it's just a way for, you know, and I say us, but the staff is almost entirely in Atlanta, and I'm just sort of this island in Miami, um, as a way of organizing you know, writing internally and, and creating something visually interesting on the website. But it also happened to fit wonderfully with this idea of artist environment, right? Or, yeah, and which was one of the themes last year. I'm gonna keep the, su the successful pitch really, really short. But the way I just, I, I just, I wrote about um, Anastasia Samoylova, the photographer who is based here. She had, she wrote a, she not wrote, she had a book published. It was called Flood Zone, a series of really beautiful, kind of abstracted photographs documenting the effects of sea level rise in Miami the ongoing gentrification, doing it in this really colorful way. I wrote about it for the New York Review of Books, uh, their blog, The Daily. Um, I liked this example because I was reject, my first three pitches were rejected, um, and I felt that this was so important to write about because it was an arts piece, but it was also about what was happening, and it was about what was happening in my hometown, and they hadn't really mentioned anything about that, but they were talking about issues in other states, and it just felt like a really nice way to narrow in on something that mattered to me and affected the people I love and did so beautifully. I know you wanted to keep it short, but maybe you could just read that first, I'd like to write. And I think that'd be helpful in you know, seeing what the beginning of a successful pitch sounds like. It says, I'd, I'd like to write about Flood Zone, and I link to it, a recently published book by the Russian-born and Miami-based photographer, Anastasia. The images which encapsulate, with gorgeous subtlety, <laughs> the real anxiety of living in a city on the blink brink of climate change are accompanied by an essay by uh, David Campany, previously published in The New Yorker. Um, and her exhibition of the same name just opened a few days ago. So. So I was saying, it's, it's relevant, you, mm -hmm. should, you should publish this. Mm -hmm. And I said, I imagine the piece at about 
under 800 words or less. So I was really targeted this time. I was very focused. Here's what I want to write about. Here's why it's important. Here's how long it's going to be. And they took it right away. Yeah. So. And it's, we don't, I don't think we have a specific slide that's like, shows a formula for like a successful pitch, but there are elements of it here that I think are, because in my experience and a lot of sort of just researching online what pitches should be sounding like and having pitched myself, you know, Monica starts with, this is what it's about, and then this middle section is like, here's what I sound like as a writer. Exactly. So if I had to like boil this down to its essence, right? Here's what I sound like as a writer, and uh, let's see what's at the end here. Usually there's a portion of it um, where you're like, also, this is who I am. But I'd already done that in my rejected <laughs> pitches previously. So like, don't so, tell us about yourself, tell us more so, about so, <laughs> so I, But I included other places that I'd written for. And the editor was to this was very responsive because she, I helped her narrow down the way in which she could include this into an editorial schedule. You know? And it might be like this, so you're giving the editor more keywords to sort of like, editors constantly doing this calculus of like what's the right fit for tomorrow or next month, right? And, and sometimes, not to un, like make it unromantic, but there is some like, okay, this actually might be a perfect fit, you know? Just, I trust that this person will be able to write what they say they're gonna write and we're looking for something like this. And so sometimes if you're rejected, you know, like this was a few times, it's just because whatever piece you're trying to write doesn't fit for that specific moment uh, and maybe not because it's trash, right? <laughs> but then that element too, I was thinking of at the end where you tell a little bit about yourself. We had talked a little bit about um, how you don't like in that part, especially if you don't have a lot of publication credits, like that, that's a good space to tell like, okay, like I haven't been published anywhere before, but here's why I'm the person to write it. Right, I don't think you need to have been, I don't think you need to be a successful active writer in order to reach out to editors. I think the opposite sometimes, honestly, because what if you're, what if this pitch was sent by, I don't know, a climate scientist who also had a love of the arts? I think that's also a real, that's perfect. You don't have to have published previously. I don't think people are always looking for a, a dense, CV. I don't think editors need to know that you're a popular writer or anything like that. It's just what matters is why you're the person to tell the story. That's what you have to convince an editor. And part of that is access too. It goes back to like that bitter southerner story. Like I hadn't really. And, and by the way, you know, I joked throughout our planning of this that I had some imposter syndrome because I only really started publishing myself like a few years ago, uh, in a big way, and so I didn't have many credits when I started sending that off, and I felt like, oh, well, you know, like, I, I'm not a writer they know, so why are they going to publish me? But at the same time, I had access to and found this way into a very specific moment in time and um, this iconic sort of food way of South Florida and was able to tie it all together in a way that they were like, okay, somebody took a flyer on me, you know? Hey, being a writer they know doesn't matter. The New York Times editor knew who I was. A friend put me in touch with her. She still rejected it. Like, it doesn't yeah. matter, right. you know? So. so I guess oh, all in all, my, uh, and I'll keep this short, too. Uh, this is my failed uh, pitch. And I'm just going to show you the response here. Um, that's your pitch. That's the pitch, pitch. right? Just and, show the response. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and this was... And I regret not replying to this, but I basically, like Monica, deleted it from my memory bank because <laughs> the editor replied with, oh, by the way, here's also a guide on how to pitch. Uh, <laughs> of pitching, like a general guide, like a general guide. I don't even know if it's theirs. The and art of pitching to do. That was an immediate, bleep, fuck off. Uh, thank you, come again. Uh, I am gonna try and forget about this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Best wishes. <laughs> <laughs> this, we did share that guide, by the way. That's in our resource. We uh, did share this, so <laughs> it ended up being very useful. But it, it kills me that it's a general guide. I didn't even realize that. I thought it was there. I think you said that it was um, one of our colleagues wrote. But, you know, I got a lot of colleagues out there. <laughs> This was a successful one, and this is, it's not necessarily relevant to the arts, but um, you see this three paragraph sort of, this has become like a hallmark of things that I do. I try and keep it tight when I pitch, you know? 
Uh, I don't put the word count in here anywhere. And this was sort of a soft pitch, I should say, because I had already had a relationship with the editor of the New Times. And um, there was an element of timeliness. Uh, there was this bit of hidden history about uh, Negro League Baseball in South Florida. And, and I wanted to tell it similarly, you know, you can tell I write primarily about like, you know, folklore and history and stuff like that. Um, stuff that, that I thought people would be interested in reading about. Um, but yeah, it's just that same, like I was boiling it down to certain points. This is like three paragraphs where you, you tell them a little bit about what the story's about. I, I actually don't talk about uh, myself here. But yeah, why, what is this, uh, I linked a, uh, to a New Times article that was sort of relevant to the piece, just to say, hey, you know, this is within your world of publication. I know that it's right for you guys. Uh, so, okay, now we get to this part. Huh? I don't want to eat this. <laughs> okay. On the drafts. Oh, we did two, two movie slides in we a row. We did two movie slides in a row here. <laughs> we did. We did. Um, so Jason and I were talking about what happens when you have a piece of writing in front of you that is not yet complete. And it looks different for everyone. I don't know what everyone's individual writing style is here. I don't know if the folks here are writing criticism or personal essays or things like that, or if you're doing more reported work. But there are a few key things you can keep in mind. And you're as you're writing, you're obviously editing yourself. If it's being published somewhere, someone else is going to look at it. But it's in order to kind of pre <laughs> pre preemptively make sure that what you're trying to say doesn't maybe get removed or doesn't maybe get caught up in whatever the editor's decisions are. You want to keep it, I don't know how to say it other than keeping it tight as possible. Really find, that, really kind of finding what your point is. You know, we were talking about, um, probing for leads. I don't think, maybe I shouldn't start there, but a lead, how would you define a lead? Because I would define it as your angle and right. the, like, the most important thing that you're trying to it's say. It's a way into the story, right? Uh, so a lead in a lot of cases, you know, in like the newspaper world is like the first, it's like the first paragraph of the story, right. technically speaking. But it's also like your way into the story. So if using my essay about stone crabs as an example, be like, you know, every year, uh, I'm going to try and pull out, pull lead out of this, right? <laughs> every year, I'm sure there's one in the story, every year uh, the citizens of Everglades City, Florida, a town, you know, 90 minutes from the metropolis of Miami gather to provide stone crabs to the rest of the world. So you're hooked in a way, right? You're like, oh, okay, so I've had a stone crab before, you know, I didn't know it came from there. Like, I would like to know more, click. And uh, the editor in me is like, okay, what will get people to engage with the piece and read it? Because if you're putting it out there, ultimately it's for people to engage with it. Um, so that's the lead, is it's sort of like a way into the story for you as a writer, but also maybe a hook on the other side, like from the readership perspective. I think also as you're finding your own voice through the piece, and I think it's important to remember why you're writing it and not think about the final form as you're editing, which sounds counterintuitive. But what I mean by that is, for example, when I'm thinking about the finished piece, I start to get stressed out because I'm thinking about how it needs, how it's going to end and how to interconnect all of these seemingly disparate and disconnected thoughts that I have. But as I'm editing, I can't think, I try not to think about that. I try to focus on each individual, again, seemingly disconnected thought and fleshing them out as much as possible so that everything I care about and everything that I want to say is on the page. I can tweak it later, and it, you will as you're writing it, but I think it's very important to not stress so much about this final, the final form. And that, that ends, that kind of naturally ends up taking you to its finish, to the finished form anyway. As you're pouring everything out, you'll start to notice, or at least I do, 
oh, this, this thing that I wanted to use to end the piece actually goes better in the middle, or maybe I even want to end it on what I thought was something I originally opened the piece with, you know? And to Monica's point of like writing it all, like you have some idea, for example, of like, okay, you have one philosophical assertion about stone crabs that you really want to explore, right? No, I'm just kidding. Everybody's gonna go eat stone crabs after this. Um, write that out as much as you can, right? So part of it is just getting these ideas out, right? And then that's when you begin the ending process. Uh, we think a lot too often up front about what I was talking to Monica about earlier uh, before the talk, which is continuity. And that's something that in films, right? Like we were joking, you know, sometimes I just like posted on India social media about uh, this clip from Miami Vice where uh, Crockett and Tubbs are heading east on the Venetian Causeway and like after a cut they're in the Everglades somehow. And, and just like extrapolating that out into writing, um, your first draft might look like that where you have this big long paragraph that you've written, you know, and why you're writing about stone crabs and then the next paragraph is like, stone crabs were first, you know, there's like this jump to somewhere else, like stone crabs were first eaten by the Calusa, you know, and so it's, you're going from your thoughts to like this history and there's no way of connecting them yet. And that's part of the editorial process is getting all these ideas that you wanna say about the topic out and then going back through and finding, you know, how do you make this feel like a continuous flowing piece? And as you're doing that, I didn't mention this when we were talking, I remembered this last night while I was working on something. Um, as I'm editing, I don't delete anything. I, d I do delete a lot of things, but what I mean by that is I save every version of the draft, every single version of a draft. I'll save it, I'll, like, I'll have version one, maybe I hate it, I copy and paste it into the next one, and then I start making cuts, but sometimes I remember that there is something from the first draft that I Maybe I didn't like that piece overall, but there was something there that belongs in the second one. So just keep saving it because you don't know what little treasures you're actually dropping until you're final finalizing it. So just keep them all. A, a sort of simple way of like having as many treasures, by the way, as you possibly can is, uh, as I was thinking of this bottom box down here, is we get caught up sometimes in, and this is a style thing maybe, but like, you will write two paragraphs that start almost the exact same way or, or you'll repeat an idea, right? Those are, if you've written the same thing twice but just they sound different, that's a cut that you have to make for yourself so that you can leave space for other treasures to come out, right? So right up front, you know that an editor reading this piece is gonna be like, well, you already said this, so it's like slash. And so if you are writing in anticipation of those cuts, you can be a little bit more precious about what you draft, right? So it's rather than repeating yourself, is there something new I can say? And in the process of saying something new, uh, you might discover another through line through the piece or just like another treasure that you can then, then you have to go through the complicated process of like, you know, keeping certain treasures or others and, and that's sort of the hardest part of the editorial relationship is when somebody uh, deletes, you were talking about a couple experiences where you had to fight for things to stay in the piece also trusting that maybe some things do need to be deleted. I, I also recommend letting somebody read it <laughs> that's not necessarily the editor. I actually share everything, almost everything I write with my sister. It's not even something I talk about, but she reads so much of what I write. She's not a writer, um, but she's very smart <laughs> and I trust her. And more importantly, she's a reader. She's an active reader. She is like, She's not someone in the Miami art world. She doesn't care about those things. She's a reader, and I want to know how she feels about it, and I want to know what she's experiencing as she's reading it. And so much of what I write has been shaped by someone completely outside of this art and literary and writing world, and I think that's really important to have someone you trust who is going to be honest with you and tell you, this is repetitive, or you actually say it here better. If you can't have someone do that, you should walk away from the piece and give yourself time and come back. That's another big part of my personal editorial process. 
staring at anything for too long is draining and you no longer see it objectively. So walk away, sometimes literally take a phys an actual walk so that the piece kind of renews itself in my brain or <laughs> reconfigures itself. Now I'm looking at it with the eyes of someone who hasn't seen it in a few days. That turns you into an editor, I think. Yeah, and it's true, and I think that's like a skill that you sort of learn, and, and uh, it takes time to truly feel like you are editing yourself, and you know, through that same practice of stepping away and looking back, it's like kind of almost like a trope of writing is to step away and come back to it later, but it is super true um, that you really can't have that objectivity until you take a, a break from it. And it's hard because you have to feel this pressure to get this thing out, you know? And, and we've been told that writing happens in this like burst of energy and all that, but it's not, it's a process. Um, the other thing too, I was thinking about, you know, how you have your sister read, we were talking about this uh, just a couple days ago. In a way, the editor is, and you have to think of the editor as your first reader too. So their instinct, they're not this like aggressive person who's like looking to cut things, you know? It's not like this adversarial relationship. Rather, they are mimicking the readership of their publication and they are experiencing your work for the first time the same way a reader might. So trusting that not only do they have this experience in writing and editing, um, but also that they are a reader of work. And, and so their reflections or their cuts might be because they know the experience of the reader and are not as attached necessarily to the nitty gritty of the piece itself. Editing is a really exhausting process. Edit, Self-editing is, is really tiring, and I think it helps to look at it as a physical process. Maybe you're not painting. Maybe Jason and I aren't painters or like installation artists, but it's labor, and you, I think you have to treat it as such and allow yourself that time. Yep. Um, <laughs> I was trying to think of it like writing in the context of like other uh, like art forms and and it is and not to say that there isn't labor and painting necessarily but it is sort of less romantic in some ways I mean you do find that like you're like these visual like these visions that you're you're sharing with people and that these visual representations of things um, that people can see them but not everybody sees writing the same way and so when I think like you have this up on a wall and it's right there. What you have to sort of consider in writing too, and, and this is all part of the editing process, is that it requires like a little bit more work on the part of a reader to read 1,500 words than it does to, and, and depending on access and your ability to be in physical locations at, phys at different times, than to look at this right here. So there's the labor of the reader too, and the way that you keep the, the reader engaged is by presenting, you know, clear images uh, by, by sort of being poetic and hoping that they respond to that by, you know, making your show, showing them who you are, making your philosophical assertions about something uh, clear as you can. And then that continuity thing that I was talking about, like I was saying right before uh, today, that sometimes you can have like magical leaps between paragraphs. As long as you're keeping the reader engaged and they're willing to go along for the ride, then, but that's, and I'm, Delivering these maxims, like there's, you know, like a way to do it. It all just depends on the piece you're writing. But if you have these, you know, big treasure filled paragraphs and then you like dive into some history without any sort of transition between them, you just have to hope that you've done enough to sort of keep the reader engaged uh, and willing to go along for that ride with you. I don't know how much time we have left. Yeah, I just realized. <laughs> Uh, so this is just like simple sort of housekeeping, right? We... Oh, we well, kind of got into a lot of this already. We did, yeah, yeah, we did talk about... We, we thought this was important to include etiquette with editors, asking for extensions. Monica asking, was certain that she had had a bunch of emails asking for ex extensions, but she might have deleted those, too. <laughs> I, really, I, don't, I don't know where they are, but I've definitely asked for a lot <laughs> of extensions. Um, the point we were trying to make with all of this was about having this relationship with your editor, especially since writing can be so, I mean, even though I write, it can be so 
cringy and embarrassing to put, <laughs> to put this all in front of another person, and it gets really personal sometimes, so it's good to ask, to not be afraid to ask them for feedback. It's really good to take in con into consideration that they are your first readers. It's, it's sometimes good to let them make cuts, but it's also important to fight for what you want to keep if you feel very strongly about it. These are such general maxims that can change depending on the specifics of what you're working on, but sort of practical matter of communication, though, is making sure that uh, expectations are clear. Yeah. So sometimes an editor uh, will give you a deadline just like right up front. And so if you can't file your story by that deadline, just making sure you communicate that clearly. Um, and that's the, honestly, that's like the number one way to maintain a positive, because editors, it's tough being a writer. Like editors, like I'm about to give you $150 or $1,000 for this, this piece that took hours, right? And hours and hours of your life. And in a lot of cases, you are like freelancing multiple of these at once. And we're all sort of creatives in this world of the arts. And, and the stakes, nobody's becoming a millionaire, you know. Well, I don't mean to set the bar low, you know. But, but ultimately, that's, that's part of it, too. So understanding that, you know, there's a generosity between people. And as long as you communicate clearly, like, nobody's going to come to your house and, like, track you down. Uh, and so I <laughs> 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 it's like somebody writing that down. Don't write that down. Oh, oh, it's on film. Um, but yeah, th that's a huge part of the clear communication between editors is um, if they give you a deadline or if telling them when you plan on handing it in by is just a huge part of that communication because the expectations are set and whether or not we meet them as long as we communicate them, that's super important. And just to be honest, we're all struggling. There was a piece I was writing for Art in America, and I, I had to just completely change it because of personal life things. And my editor said very candidly, it's just a magazine. She was like, it's just a magazine. She was like, at the end of the day, this is a magazine, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, it was sort of in a way, you know, like entertainment. Like, it, I mean, it's an art form. And, and so it shouldn't be sort of given this like hardcore a capitalist treatment, like uh, we're, we're all just doing this because we love it. And that we're paid for it is wonderful. And that we're able to continue to do that uh, because we're paid for it is wonderful. But anyways, yeah, just don't, I don't like over, I would just say if I were giving like a piece of advice, just don't um, lend too much sort of credence to this idea that it's an adversarial relationship or, or that you're gonna like lose uh, you know, your career track because you didn't communicate clearly uh, the deadline of a piece or when you were going to have an in by. I, I just think that it's best not to keep those pressures on yourself. It's a self edit. It's hard about getting paid for your writing, too. I don't even know how. Oh. Best way to get paid is to steal a big safe. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And we felt that this was relevant because these are things you work out with an editor, you know. But um, do we have any notes on it? We do. Yeah, we can just like breeze through it. These are just some industry standards. Uh, some public all there's an industry standard. Pu writer writers don't get paid well. Arts writers get paid worse. Um, <laughs> it like that's just facts. But. Sometimes you get paid per word. Sometimes there's a flat fee. It's on, it's the uh, publication's responsibility to communicate that with you and yours to ask. Well, I'll say this too, and, uh, and it's not necessarily uh, quote unquote public knowledge, but anybody that sends me a pitch to Burn Away, I'll immediately tell them what expectations and rates are. And, so, and some of you here might want to write for it. It's we pay people 75 cents a word for writing, which is a good rate. Uh, relative to the industry. Um, you know, that means if you write a thousand words, you get paid $750. And, you know, it might not be $2 a word at some legacy media publications, right, or whatever, but it's, it's good. And, and it's just, you know, if, if you haven't been published, there's still the opportunity to make that, and some people haven't made $100, let alone $750 to write an essay. Sometimes, maybe, the place, the place you're writing for doesn't pay that well and you want to do it anyway and that's why we talked about knowing your worth because there's it, it there's always this kind of argument about 
paying writers and paying artists well because we deserve to be paid well for this time and labor and effort and care. Um, and I don't believe in you know, doing something simply for exposure because we all need to survive. But again, if there's something you really love and there is a place for it, and maybe their rates just aren't that good, you have to de determine for yourself if it's something you wanna do anyway. I think it's a good piece of advice, especially if you're earlier in your career and you're like, I, you have this goal in mind of being published in a specific place, but you know, as Monica said, their rates aren't great. You know, there is some compromise that has to happen, but you also don't want to end up in this cycle of like letting yourself be exploited. So it's all this sort of sliding scale of like, okay, I, I would love to be published in Bomb Magazine, but uh, you know, the rates are set at a Bomb certain. Bomb Magazine pays $150 for a 1500 Word That's it, you know. Q and A. So you, <laughs> so you interview the artist, you transcribe it yourself, you're doing all that. And it's 150 dollars, but I love writing for Bomb, so. Uh, so yeah, and then we were gonna do this thing. Do we you think we have, do this do we have thing. enough time for I don't it? Think we have enough time. We were just gonna <laughs> live edit. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, we'll do this. We'll just run through this quick and see if we can like. No, we're doing both. <laughs> this is the painting. We got time. This is the painting. Uh, what's it called? The barge. You recognize this. It's called the basin. It's called the basin. It's called the basin, and that's like the barge out center. And we made this challenge to each other. We identified this work of art, and we made this challenge to each other to write a hundred words about it, and uh, and then edit it in person in front of you all here today. Um, it's, like, yeah. it's by John Singer Sargent. He came to Miami John Singer Sargent. And I guess we'll see if we'll just give you that information and see if either one of us does a good enough job of, you know, the extra context. So I came up with a title for my piece. Eventually left it in quotes because I knew she was going to make that note. Yeah. <laughs> Sergeant had come to his, uh, had come to the Sky Island Library for his education, and I guess everything. And while from the fairyland, he um, was a little junior when he started to start to get revealing, and his eyes were a lot of this palpable and quote from junior is referring to Deus as painting for Bahamian construction workers, but similarly objectified the property. The barge was a perfect symbol for every gilded age. Are there any places where we could maybe cut a word or two and get it closer? Is that, a, is that a repetition thing? Is that like in some way you're already saying it's revealing? I think that that second quote says more about what revealing means in that context. And, and I'm rather focused. It's classic show, don't tell. Exactly. <laughs>
a good question, but that's like the kind of thing, like as an editor, where you would highlight that and ask the question of the writer because it's you know, if you that's part of like I guess an editor is the, you talk about imposter syndrome. Sometimes I'm like, you know, I don't know, but I have an inkling, so I'm gonna ask the writer this too because we're gonna learn this together, and and I think that's important is to you know I'm not like some holy figure. I don't know every if you capitalize gilded age, but I would like the writer to know. Not the, the sen last sentence isn't too long? No, I was thinking about that, but I actually don't think it's too long because the rhythm of that sentence is expressive of the kind of frustrating reality of the situation. Um, maybe I would put an end dash between mansion and goods to break up the sentence but not change its rhythm. I don't want to change the rhythm of that sentence, but I want to give the reader a break. <laughs> so I would put built almost entirely by Martin Luther King, like that. That makes sense. That's what I would say. I remove, I rearrange that sentence that begins with the model to fairyland, cut out revealing, add an M dash, and just yeah, essentially give the reader a pause. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is you know we we crank these out, okay? So these are. We didn't read each other's either. You didn't read mine beforehand. I put it in the PowerPoint early, and I she claimed she did it. I swear I did. I swear <laughs> I don't have a title. Oh, uh, so that's a problem. We gotta, you know. I don't have a title. <laughs> <laughs> it's too long. It's way overworked. Now. <laughs> I was joking that she was gonna come up with two hundred words, uh, but this is. I'm very pleased to be honest. After John Singer Sargent visited Ormond, Florida, in 1917 to paint a portrait of John D. Rockefeller, he headed south to see Charles Deering, another millionaire and a dear friend at Viscay. I think that we don't necessarily need to know that he was in Ormond, Florida. Like this, we're specifically focused in 100 words on this painting. So it's like we don't. Who cares about Ormond? You know. Yeah. I mean, I, we know. Okay. And on the flip side of that, though, is it does sort of tell us what he was up to and captures that idea that he was painted industrialists, right? And right. what brought him down like south. Florida. Tycoons. But, yeah. But maybe we, we don't need that in a piece about. One painting. Yeah, it's this Who one specific paint painting. this sort of like crystallized moment in time. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's just a, maybe a, an immediate sort of suggestion. So I would sort of, um, you know, in 1917, John Singer Sargent came to Vizcaya. Might be a way to like really cut that down. Although we do need one more line uh, where we would sort of explain why he was there. So, re so that whole sentence needs to be reworked. Yes, <laughs> and in, in reworking it, we might chop a few words. Um, there he painted the residence, then still under construction, charmed equally by the ornate structure. Okay, so as a, at this guy, there he, changed, uh, there he painted the residence, still, then still under charmed equally by the ornate structure and its ambient sort of tropical fauna. Um, maybe we can remove the word ambient. Oh, no, but I don't know, Monica's so poetic, so I don't, I, it's always hard for me to remove uh, her like very effusive and vivid descriptions of things. Um, if we're really like if we're doing this mathematically and I am putting on my editorial hat of like tightening up sentences I might say instead of there this is like really nitpicky by the way like there he painted the residence then still under construction that you might be able to take those those three clauses and make it like he painted the under construction residence you know and there's like a way to rewrite that Nathan, someone we know an editor we know told me my uh my syntax is jarring. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true because it's, I mean, they're, they're, the sentences are long in the same, you know, actually in a different way from the way mine are, but um, like I was saying before, and not to be overly uh, praising here, is they're very poetic and, and, and really pretty sentences. And, and so, you know, it's jarring because he's, he's a, a meathead. Uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna go beat him up after, but um, I think that they they work well and they're a signature style, Monica. So Sergeant's Florida trip is commonly understood as a brief immersion into paradise before returning to Europe and, and the war. This might be the way to start the piece, by the way, instead of saying Ormond, Florida, because you're saying that he's in Florida, right? right. So you, rather than saying he visited, or you're saying now that he visited Florida twice. Right. Such so repetition. Uh, funny then that Vizcaya was this time in the spirit of Argos drawn from that continent, and so that's a really cool line. Uh, and so I don't think you would lose his connection to Europe. Right. 
um, I would keep that and that might be the lead. And, uh, and built by Bohemian Lambert, so we both settled on, on Singer Sargent's uh, propensity to sort of objectify laborers who got no credit uh, for the construction of almost all of like Miami at the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's about their bodies, that's a beautiful line, their names undocumented, but their bodies depicted and exotified on Sargent's. In the basin, Vizcaya, the state's famous stone barge, is at a distance, an nautical plaything to impress and entertain only the invited guests of his insular foe, Eden. A not, okay, so a nautical play thing to impress and entertain only the invited guests of this insular foe. I think I've made enough notes. Uh, yeah. The end is lovely. <laughs> That's kind of like, I don't know, I guess, just some ways of thinking about tightening things up and editing. Yeah, avoiding repetition, <laughs> not getting too attached to things you've written. <laughs> Not bringing uh, the baggage of what a previous editor told you about your sentences to, to the writing desk. <laughs>